What's up everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. If this is your first time here, my name is Richard and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. Subscribe for all kinds of content just like this and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. This is my statistics tutorial series where I give you all the applied statistics knowledge that you need to conquer the data science world. In my last video in the statistics tutorial series, I talked about confidence intervals and how a lot of times in applied work, you will get asked to estimate some kind of unknown quantity, but a lot of clients, they don't wanna see just a point estimate, they wanna see an interval estimate, and that way they understand how uncertain you are about that estimate. If you haven't seen that video yet, I highly recommend watching that one before this one. There'll be a card for it up above, as well as a link in the description. Now, the other tool for learning about unknown quantities is hypothesis testing. In my confidence interval video, I used an example of Americans and how often they use their phones on a daily basis. So let's just use the same example here. And let's suppose you hear on the news somewhere that using your phone for more than three and a half hours a day is bad for you. Let's say it causes cancer or something like that. So you want to conduct a statistical test to demonstrate that, in fact, Americans use their phones for less than three and a half hours a day. So you create a sample of 50 Americans. Let's just say it's a perfectly random and representative sample in this case. And you come back with a sample mean X bar of 3.2 hours and a sample standard deviation S of 1.2 hours. And then immediately your question should be, statistically, can we conclude that the average time Americans spend on their phones on a daily basis is in fact less than 3.5 hours? And hypothesis testing is geared to answer questions exactly like these. So we're going to walk through all the steps of this problem, but just keep in mind as we go along, all a hypothesis test is, is just a probability calculation that uses real world data. Naturally, the devil is in the details and there's a little bit more convention and formality than just that. But at the end of the day, that's really all it is that we're doing. So these are the following steps to a hypothesis testing problem. First of all, we're going to define a null hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis, and a significance level. After that, we're going to calculate a test statistic. Third of all, we're going to use that test statistic to calculate a p-value. And then in our last step, we're going to compare that p-value to our significance level alpha. You're either going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis, and then you're gonna make a real world conclusion. So let's walk through each one of these steps. First step, we have defining the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, and the significance level. Starting with the significance level here, that's very closely related to the confidence level that you would select if you're making a confidence interval. In fact, the significance level is represented by the symbol alpha, and the confidence level is represented by one minus alpha. Now, as far as the hypotheses are concerned, these are statements about a parameter. We represent the null and alternative hypotheses with H0 for the null, and then HA or H1, you'll sometimes see it written, for the alternative hypothesis. Now, let's actually start with the alternative hypothesis first, and that's whatever it is that we're trying to demonstrate by using the statistical test in the first place. In our example, we actually wanted to demonstrate that the population mean hours Americans use their phones is less than 3.5 hours. So we're going to set up HA as mu smaller than 3.5. The null hypothesis is just the opposite of whatever the alternative hypothesis is. So here we can write mu equals 3.5, although technically the opposite is mu is greater than or equal to 3.5. So you can write either one of those down. It really doesn't matter. We have the null and the alternative hypotheses written down. We're going to use alpha equals 0.05 for our significance level, just because 0.05 is conventional and it's standard. And then bam, we're done. On to step two. Now in step two, we have to calculate a test statistic. And all this is, is a quantity that describes how extreme the results of your data are in one way or another. Now we use a statistical distribution here the same way we do with tons of other probability calculations. 
Now what we're doing here is a probability calculation about a population mean. And in virtually all of these instances, you don't know the population variance or population standard deviation either. So in all of these instances, we use a T distribution. The theoretical reason for that is a subject for a different video, but the long and short of it is that in the overwhelming majority of problems involving a population mean, you will use a T distribution. However, in instances involving a population proportion, you'll use a Z statistic from a normal 0, 1 distribution. So in our case here, we calculate a T statistic. The T statistic for a one sample T test is just equal to X bar minus mu naught over the standard error of X bar, where the standard error of X bar equals S divided by the square root of N. So if we just plug all our numbers from our example in here, we get T equals 3.2 minus 3.5 divided by 1.2 over the square root of 50, which gives us negative 1.7677. Now that you've calculated your test statistic, you're going to move on to step three, which is where you use the distribution of that test statistic to calculate what's called a p-value. And now I'm going to have a whole video on what a p-value is and is not, but the short definition of it is that a p-value is the probability you observe a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than you did, assuming the null hypothesis is in fact true. For finding the p-value, you can use a t-distribution table, of which there's tons of them out there, or you can use r. I personally like using r, so that's what we're going to do here. And the p-value is going to be the area to the left of t equals negative 1.7677. Why? Because when we talk about more extreme, that means in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. We have a left-sided test here, that is the alternative is that mu is less than 3.5, so the p-value is the area on the left side of the statistic as well, that is the area to the left using a t-distribution with 49 degrees of freedom of t equals negative 1.7677. Now we go into R and we use an appropriate probability function and we find that the p-value is 0 0.0417. Now if we want to relate that p-value into our problem, that means that the probability that we would observe a result as extreme or more extreme than we did if in fact the null hypothesis was true is only 0 0.0417. Now that's a pretty low probability. In step four, lastly, we're going to compare that p-value we just calculated to our significance level that we picked at the beginning of this exercise. If the p-value is less than alpha, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than alpha, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. 0 0.0417 is less than 0 0.05, so in our case here, we reject the null hypothesis, and our conclusion is there is statistically significant evidence based on the test that we just did that the true average number of hours that Americans spend on their phones daily is less than 3.5 hours. Now let's suppose that we found a p-value that was greater than 0 0.05. Well, in that instance, we would say that we failed to reject this null hypothesis. And you may be asking yourself, okay, that's some really negative language that we've got going on here. We've got reject the null versus fail to reject the null. Why don't we talk about accepting either the null or the alternative? Well, you have to be really careful with that language because a hypothesis test really does not prove anything. All a hypothesis test is really doing is trying to assess by counterexample if it seems to be likely that the null hypothesis is false. Your example may not have demonstrated it to be false, but even if you don't reject the null hypothesis, your test isn't set up to demonstrate that the null hypothesis is necessarily true either. Another related point is if we get all of this wrong. So again, we calculated a p-value of 0 0.0417, so the probability we observe something as extreme or more extreme than we did if the null hypothesis is true is 0 0.0417. Because that's such a low probability, we decide it's more likely the null hypothesis isn't true and we reject it. However, based on the same test, 
there is still that 0.0417 chance that this would have happened even if the null hypothesis were true. So we would have rejected the null hypothesis even if it's actually true and we would have made a mistake. Now this is what's called a type one error. The probability of a type one error is represented by alpha and it's the probability that we reject the null hypothesis if it's actually true. This is the exact same thing as the significance level, and we select this at the beginning based on how serious the consequences of such an error are. Now in the other direction, it could be the case that the null hypothesis is actually false, but we end up with a p-value of greater than alpha, and then we fail to reject it even when it's false. This is what's called a type two error. The probability of a type two error is the probability that we fail to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually false. And this probability is represented by the character beta. There's a related quantity, one minus beta, and that's the statistical power of the test. That is, that's the chance that you correctly reject the null hypothesis if it's actually false. But type one and type two errors and power are a full topic in and of themselves, and that's a subject for a different video. So to conclude, this is an overview of the hypothesis testing framework and the steps which will go into any hypothesis testing problem. This is part of a three-part series on this topic. The next part will cover p-values in greater detail, and then the next part after that will cover type one, type two errors, and statistical power. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you'd like to support my work, the best thing that you could do for me would be to share this video. Otherwise, please consider smashing the like button, and then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.